Living Room Logic. Welcome to Living Room Logic, a place for you to chill out and have a laugh with two scientists who know too much about very, very little. Aidan is a published scientist who has a PhD in marine biology. And Andrew is teaching in university, finishing off his master's and starting a PhD in neuroscience. Yeah, that wasn't funny or punny at all. We should mention at least once that we're not radiating waste here. Okay, this episode we navigate the pros and cons of nuclear technology, how some scientists blew up a squash core with a nuclear reactor, and how people somehow keep losing nuclear warheads. Be a part of the reaction and follow the podcast on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Come find us on Instagram or Twitter or other social media that your odd uncle forwards messages <laughs> to you on. <laughs> Sit back and enjoy this explosive dud of a debate. <laughs> Welcome to the next podcast. It is I, Andrew McGovern, with Aidan Lang here. And we're going to be talking this week about nuclear energy and nuclear things in general, nuclear families and nuclear wars not really being qualified to be listened to but you know we can definitely have a chat about it at least (laughs) yes we can andrew we are two biologists we are enthusiasts and we love science and why not and we're not looking for answers because there are many but to crack this off in what is nuclear energy what is nuclear science what are we talking about yeah so there are a lot of molecules that Mm -hmm. are stable yeah you're walking around and things aren't exploding and trying to kill you as you're walking down the street okay (laughs) yeah but some things are unstable called radioactive compounds that always want to decay and these things were Mm -hmm. formed right back at the start of the big bang you know 14 billion years ago or at least 12 billion years ago and The thing about these radioactive compounds is that they can break up really easily. And there's actually a certain amount of these in the Earth's crust. Okay, One of the most important things for everyone to know first is uh, you need to have a very basic understanding of of what a a molecule is made up of. And Mm -hmm. it's made up of things called atoms. Neutrons are neutral particles. Protons are positive particles and they stick together in what is known as a nucleus. Mm -hmm. Flying around the atom are these negatively charged particles that are much smaller and they're known as electrons. Yeah. But what's most important for nuclear science is the fact that in some particles, especially radioactive particles, there's a lot more neutrons than on other non-radioactive compounds. And Andrew, would you know anything about how people found these radioactive particles and how they manipulated them? I do, as of very recently. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, buddy. Uh, yeah. The idea of nuclear fission, the breaking apart of a natural molecule to cut it with hitting it with an even smaller piece of matter and it separating it going through nuclear fission to produce more energy that was first demonstrated by our old friend Enrico Fermi remember the guy who was wondering about how much life is in the universe well here he comes again okay in Rome in 1934 he demonstrated fission he just shot a neutron at a piece of uranium and it split and they were left with two different elements of the periodic table and they didn't fully understand what was going on. Mm -hmm. But then they kept looking into it and they discovered that adding this one neutron split the original piece of uranium into two separate elements. This was later confirmed in 1938 by a pair of Germans who then went to a Danish scientist called uh, Lisa Meitner. Right, And th- this Lisa Meitner had just ran off from Nazi Germany because it wasn't very nice over there. Who can blame her? Uh, mm-hmm. So for very obvious reasons, she got out of Dodge. And in Copenhagen, she met with Niels Boher, who's another big 20th century scientist. Mm-hmm. Again, showed that when you add a neutron to an already unstable element, it'll just split. Yeah. Okay. It's funny how all these sciencey things kind of tie together because 
that was also a demonstration of Albert Einstein's E equals MC squared, because they shot the neutron in, then they ended up with less mass than was originally in the experiment. The, yeah. And they were wondering what happened to it. Because it was a very simple mathematic equation. They were <clears throat> yeah. saying, that's weird. We, we sent a neutron at this uranium mm-hmm. atom and it created two, two things that didn't add up yeah. to the amount of neutrons that they put in. Yeah, exactly. So that. that must have meant that energy was produced. Yeah. So instead, so where we lost the mass, we produced a large amount of energy. Quickly following that, uh, Niels Bower and Fermi met in Washington, of all places. It's documented that they actually discussed the first self-sustaining chain reaction, right? Which is to say that it's not just shooting a neutron at a piece of uranium. It's Mm -hmm. shooting a neutron at a piece of uranium, which will shoot out more neutrons, which will hit other pieces of uranium, which will shoot out more and on and on, creating a chain reaction of fission, which will grow exponentially. Think of it like getting a bowling ball and hitting an infinite number of pins, where you just roll the one in and all the pins knock down every single pin behind it, and it keeps going like a series of dominoes. Okay. You know, that that's what they mean by the self-sufficient chain reaction. So you only put in a little bit of energy and then it goes wild. Okay? okay. In order to do that, you need something called a critical mass. The correct amount. You know, because if you have too much, things are going to go bad. If you don't have enough, <laughs> they're going to burn out. But when you get into that sweet spot, that lovely middle point, then it can be self-sufficient and controllable. Mm-hmm. Three years later, in 1942, in Chicago... They planned to build the first reactor in a squash court in the athletics hall in in the university in Chicago. Why would they possibly do that? (laughs) Lack of funding? I don't know. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) They were like, there's no lab space for you crazy people. Let's put you in the squash courts. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Your your squash team's terrible, so we're going to blow it up. (laughs) Yeah. But anyway, they did it, which was amazing. They made this... A self-sufficient chain reaction, which is the basis of everything you have ever heard of with the word nuclear in it. Nuclear energy, nuclear bombs, all of these things Mm -hmm. start off with this self-sufficient chain reaction idea. Very cool. And the thing that blows my mind about this is that it took eight years to, to go from demonstrating that it can be done to making a nuclear reactor that produces energy. Potentially even more scary, it only took 11 years to actually make the nuclear bombs. Crazy. So you're saying that the same, like the same technology that was put into making that first nuclear reactor, Mm -hmm. which is a form of energy. Yeah. That is a purely civilian application. That was made with the idea that that would be used to be put into the electrical grid, right? What you can say it was that it definitely wasn't initially said to be used for war. That wasn't the plan. The plan was they just study mm-hmm. physics for the sake of physics. They Only when they have to do they think of the outer world, the mean, cruel world <laughs> that doesn't understand the lovely things that they recognize. Yeah. And, you know, it's very likely that these people were looking at these things because they thought they were amazing and they were beautiful and they were seeing something that hadn't been seen before. And then they realize, oh, my God, look at the amount of energy being produced. Einstein came up with this thing that said, we're going to produce so much more energy. And if we can make it self-sustainable, isn't that the perfect source of energy? That's what you want. I mean, to put it into context during that time, you're talking wartime. You know, you're talking just before the the Second World War. Hitler's invaded Europe and the Americans are not really knowing what's going to happen. At the same time the only energy production sector is Mm. pretty much coal. This was all, at that time, then put into the war effort, right? They saw it as an opportunity to be more productive. Yeah. We're making more energy. We can now be more productive than our enemies. Which, you know, makes sense, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I can talk a little bit more about that first reactor that you were chatting about. It was known as the Chicago Pile... It just honestly looks very basic at that point in time. You have uranium, which is that radioactive compound, and you have several tons of naturally occurring uranium in the middle of this pile. 
and surrounding the pile is a thing called a moderator and what the okay. moderator does is it basically slows down the chain reaction that's going on in the middle of the reactor mm-hmm. it was made of a thing called graphite which is basically just carbon all you need to worry about is that it slows down neutrons like graphite in your pencils it's very dense yeah. molecules it's really mm. dense carbon mm-hmm. and it's very stable and all it does is if a neutron is flung through it it'll slow it down yeah it'll actually help absorb it right yeah so that first one had no form of coolant which is a very important thing for say <laughs> all of the further yeah. reactors in yeah. the future going down this energy yeah. timeline Andrew from the Chicago pile they started to mm. realize okay how do we actually get the heat energy from the reaction because the reactor is super super hot millions yeah. of degrees celsius mm-hmm. and so how can you harness that how do you turn that actually physically into electricity you literally get water pumps to go mm. through the reactor and then you get the water to turn into steam it's called a secondary loop Mm -hmm. And then you get the steam in that to turn a turbine. And the turbine fuels the generator and forms electricity. Hey, presto, you have a brand new form of energy. All right. But one thing that is really important for people to know is that there's basically different types of uranium. One of them is really, really radioactive, easily broken up in this thing that we call fission. Yeah. It's called uranium-235, but not Mm -hmm. to get too bogged down in these numbers because it can (laughs) get very complex. But I think it's something like less than a percent of naturally occurring uranium is made up of this really what we call fissile fuel. Okay, yeah. And the other 90-something percent Mm. is made up of uh, non-fissile uranium. So that's basically the stuff that it's only waste Mm. basically these uranium reactors create a lot of waste Mm. okay the use of water in these early reactors and moving on past world war ii and into the 1960s a lot of the power plants were just Mm. using water as such they're called light water reactors and hundreds of these started popping up around the world yeah What they didn't really think about is that uranium reactors, they produce a lot of that toxic nuclear waste, uh, uranium-238, which is radioactive but doesn't work in the reaction. And it takes, I think it's something like 100,000 years for it to become non-radioactive. So this nuclear fuel is Mm -hmm. a massive problem. But there are several other reactors that have been thought up and that have been experimented on. Yeah, yeah. But because of the war and everything like that, they didn't really get a lot of attention. Um, One of them is called a thorium reactor. That's another radioactive compound, but it's way less radioactive than uranium. And it's a lot more abundant than naturally occurring uranium in the world there's about four times as much thorium in the world than there is uranium and the idea was that you could use a liquid instead of water but a salt something like sodium or um, magnesium and liquefy it that that sounds dodge (laughs) yeah it's it's in what's all right yeah because in terms of chemistry so many elements on their own are extremely reactive so what they do naturally is is that elements will almost immediately attach to another element that makes them stable so the idea of using thorium as a fuel and using this what is known as a molten salt reactor is that the the salt absorbs the heat really really well way better than water Mm -hmm. and then it's a very similar schematic to your uranium fission reactor yeah yeah you're you're literally using the exact same concept 
as the uranium reactor. You're just mm. using a different compound. Yeah. And the amazing thing about thorium is that the waste that it produces only takes 300 years to break down instead of oh, wow. 100,000 years. That's that's really interesting. But I do ha- but if it's much quicker to break down, does that not make it more radioactive? I think the thing is with radioactive compounds especially uh n- especially nuclear waste. Mm. They're all extremely radioactive. <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Um but that's a really good question. I yeah. actually don't know. I love all these fresh ideas about like, you know, revolutionizing things that we already know and we already understand. You know what? Power to them if they can get it done. There is one other amazing technology as well that brings us from our use of these uranium fission reactors and even maybe moves past thorium. Okay. And and maybe it's one of the reasons why these thorium reactors never really came to fruition. Yeah. Because there isn't a single thorium reactor in the world right now. Oh, right. So this is all theoretical, is it? The last thorium reactor was made, and to be honest, it actually didn't even use thorium. It had to use uranium first before they could show that it would use thorium. Okay. It was made in the 60s. No way. And because of what what we'll talk about later is that (laughs) this funding for nuclear research was basically axed kind of after World War Two. Yeah, yeah. But it's being revived today because we have this massive issue with climate change. Yeah. The amount of CO2 and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are, are way too high and there's an, the Earth's temperature is going to just be too high for uh, humans to live on it in terms of the production of food and and survival itself. And the idea is that nuclear energy is actually incredibly clean in that perspective because nuclear energy although it creates this highly dense highly toxic nuclear waste none of that is released into the environment yeah or at least when When, accidents don't happen yeah no that's definitely a, a big pro of nuclear energy in the sense that all other forms of energy produce quite a bit of waste you know the burning of fossil fuels naturally produces a load of carbon dioxide which will go up into the atmosphere and it's not captured but even things like um, solar panels actually produce a significant amount of waste the production of the fabrics the production of the materials the recycling of the materials is almost nil all of this production does produce a significant amount of waste whilst when, when you consider the amount of energy uh, produced by a nuclear plant to the amount of waste, it's it's minute. Yeah, it's the most efficient type of energy if you put it to output versus waste. It's only a matter of making sure you don't let the world have access to nuclear waste, because that's bad. That's yeah, not good. Yeah, exactly. And when you compare the amount of energy that's produced compared to the amount of weight of the actual substance that's being say burned yeah when you think of coal and you compare it to those early uranium fission reactors yeah it's a hundred thousand times more efficient okay that's it that's a number yeah there's another idea that we can actually make an even more efficient type of reactor called a fusion reactor oh yeah yeah and the efficiency of this is apparently, this is crazy, Andrew, 10 million times more efficient <laughs> per weight than coal. Yeah, um, but but like that's still a scientific fever dream. It was very difficult to find actual research on, on fusion reactors and they sound absolutely daft because those two things are quite easy to get mixed up but nuclear fission is breaking up those uranium atoms. Nuclear fusion is getting (laughs) two very light or small atoms Mm -hmm. and bringing them together. Yeah. And that happens in the heart of a star. And and so really cool research is coming out, though. There's one project in particular 
they've actually already made a fusion reactor generation fusion i think is the name of the company okay um wow. and the idea is first of all so difficult to fuse two atoms together yeah but the best element is hydrogen yeah because they're they're some of the smallest lightest elements in the world yeah and <laughs> turns out right this is crazy but you need to get a space as hot as 150 million degrees celsius <laughs> oh, to cause oh. Oh. these things to be pushed yeah. together into each other when you heat up elements it makes them really really active and they move mm-hmm. around a lot yeah. and when you bring it up to that temperature that crazy unfathomable <laughs> temperature that is the only time where you will get them to smash into each other and make what is called helium uh, yeah what happens when you do that is that when it makes helium it releases a neutron and it creates a ridiculous amount of energy again yeah millions of times more yeah. than what we talked about earlier with breaking yeah. up uranium i suppose just to be the bearer of bad news is that 150 million degrees celsius isn't naturally occurring so <laughs> you know for, for every one of these little getting these hydrogen uh, atoms to come together you know you just need a environment of 150 million degrees celsius yeah and as, as it happens you know it's like that's one thing that I was so confused about because these people, they have already done this. They've already created a mm. centre where it can create that amount of temperature. I don't doubt the ability to produce the temperature. I just doubt the effic- efficiency to produce yeah, the temperature. You're that's absolutely the, right. That's the question, you know, because mm. like the, the advantage of fission is that it's self-sufficient. Once you get it going, it going. You know, it's gone. It's it's just going to keep keep kicking itself up the butt and it's going to keep splitting atoms and it's going to keep throwing neutrons around the place until you shove a bit of graphite into it to tell it to calm down. Yeah. But with fusion, as far as I know, as a self-sufficient chain reaction, like uh, a nuclear reactor will go on. It, it doesn't matter the circumstances. Yeah. As long as there's enough neutrons and enough uranium, it's going to blow. Yeah. But if you need to have this perfect environment for nuclear fusion to occur it's much much more troubling i would <laughs> simply put it <laughs> yeah it's cra- it's crazy like right now it is insanely expensive billions of dollars like to yeah. make these things but the idea is that they can scale it up to a point where you can suspend hydrogen at 150 million degrees celsius in a form called plasma mm-hmm. that's what it forms yeah. And it's inside this big donut that's, Damn. you know, maybe 50 meters wide, right? And oh, outside right. the donut is a bunch of magnets. Okay. They're super magnets and they suspend the plasma. You got me all excited when you said donut. And then you said it was 150 meters wide and I got even more excited. And then you said magnets and I, I felt my teeth crunch. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this was uh, sounding so tasty. It sounded delicious. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> mm, plasma sounds spicy. <laughs> yeah, but, sounds like it would be a savory thing. Yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, but that's that's really cool. And like there's stuff like that that just blows my mind. And. I suppose it's one of those things that like, if you put enough money in to demonstrate that it's possible, more people mm-hmm. will try to do it because they know that if you can get nuclear fusion done efficiently, win-win. Like it's the, mm-hmm. the energy fight is over because we haven't even conceived of anything that might be more efficient than nuclear fusion. So if you yeah. can get if you get that done and like, you know, as, as you can see, like when we were talking about nuclear fusion, it was eight years between demonstration and first reactor. Mm -hmm. So uh, I I suppose it's not that unfeasible to then turn and say, well, we're only now starting to make very simple fusion reactors. And (laughs) even if it is this ridiculously expensive thing, who's not to say that in eight years it might be better? That's an idea that's in Silicon Valley to do with microchips is known as Moore's Law. 
you know, every couple of years, technology totally advances and it's on an almost exponential yeah. scale. So it is, yeah. the closest projects in terms of fusion reactors, mm. they are already saying that they will finally make a fusion reactor that will make more energy than they put into it. Yeah. Moore's law, it's fascinating because it's kind of how... Um, Good technology will help you make great technology, and great technology will help you make amazing technology. And amazing tech, and it keeps growing, and it keeps growing, and it keeps, and that's the idea. Mm. And uh, anyone who buys a phone over the last twenty years, I had a Blockia. I was exceptionally happy with my Blockia. Like I got it at my at my uh, communion, and everyone was around me as I was there playing Snake, and we were passing the phone around playing Snake, and that was the thing to do. And God, that was like 15 years ago. Yeah. Now my phone has amazing back camera. It has cameras on it that are better than cameras you could buy in shops 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, it has connection to the internet. It's touch screen. I can do whatever I can do on my computer. I can do it on my phone. Like yeah. that's in that's in 15 years. What the hell happened with nuclear energy then? How come we're not flying and flying cars that are all nuclear powered <laughs> the nuclear why are we not in and... this this crazy sci-fi world that yeah. is run by clean nuclear energy i i think the most blatant way to think about this is is because a lot of it is um politically driven it, it's not so much mm -hmm. you know you think it's because we hear nuclear and we think <gasps> nuclear oh no you know mm -hmm. disaster x disaster y atrocity x atrocity y the best example I can give of why our perception of nuclear has interrupted the development of nuclear is if you look at the American image of nuclear energy and radioactivity in the 50s and 60s, and you yeah. look at J Japan, right? Mm -hmm. The nuclear family. Get your home and your car and have your kids and your wife and, you know, everyone, you know, you go to work and you come home and your wife has apple pie and, you know, that was the... In your big bubbly, shiny in, car. Exactly. And that's how they saw the year 2000. You had little bubble car like the thing on The Simpsons and you'd be flying away and that was the promise of nuclear and, oh, what a wonderful colour it painted on nuclear after the Americans dropped the bomb. Yeah. Yeah. But then you look at Japan, right? And Japan associate nuclear energy and nuclear war and all of that with obviously much worse things because they were on the receiving end. And that's yeah. where a lot of things like Godzilla came into being, where they, oh. yeah, where they in America, they associate with like happiness, the nuclear family and, you know, the, the how to get wealthy and live a good life. And mm -hmm. in Japan, it was disaster. It was horror movies. It was disdain and fear. Dropping the bomb because that used nuclear technology, it left a stain on all nuclear technology. Yeah. Well, if you could wreck these cities in Japan, why would you bring that to my city? Why would mm -hmm. you have a nuclear plant, you know, here or there? So what you're saying is that the dropping of those two atomic bombs, mm. that tainted our perception of nuclear. It's an association which is the problem. It's yeah. We really shouldn't be associating a law of physics and a thing that we're implementing that can happen to be used for a great evil with something which is has a lot of potential. But it is important to say now, and as as an important con for all of this, every time a country wanted to get involved in nuclear energy, they got a ban. You know what I'm saying? It was, yeah. it was, it, th th there's no countries that got involved in it that didn't have a bomb program. Yeah. They all, they got the technology, they built the reactor, and then they had a bomb in the back basement. You know, they yeah. had it, just in case. That's kind of where we lead into, like, um, the concept of mutually assured destruction. And to, even just saying that phrase, mutually assured destruction, kind of refers to why they're, the Cold War was a Cold War. If you hit me with a nuke, I'll hit you with a nuke and everyone in the world loses. That's yeah. mutually assured destruction. But you associate that with nuclear weapons, nuclear energy. You associate it all together. You're putting it all in the one basket. Mm -hmm. When in reality, nuclear energy isn't 
it's not a bomb. <laughs> no, and, and I, it goes it goes back to what we were talking about with yeah. naturally occurring uranium, and the fact that naturally occurring uranium has about what three or five percent of the super uh, useful yeah. and super dangerous uranium two three five, which is the isotope that, if you enrich that, yeah, to very high percentages, you can create an atomic bomb. But yeah. you cannot create an atomic bomb with naturally occurring uranium. No. Yeah, and that's true. But that's not to say that um, nuclear reactors are foolproof. A big pro of nuclear energy is that in the world right now, there are about 400 to 450 nuclear reactors, right? And it produces 10% of all of the world's energy, which is crazy. It's crazy high. It's really high. Like, just think of it: four hundred buildings in the world produce ten percent of the energy in the world. That's crazy. Okay? That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, actually, it it's is a great way to look at it. Um, and I think that's cool. But considering the mechanism that you said, what it's effectively doing is boiling water and spinning a turbine. I really think it's a very aggressive approach to making a kettle. I think it's you know, <laughs> <laughs> but like seriously though, like in, in, rea- right. in, in reality. It is a very aggressive approach to boiling mm. water, to it's spin a turbine. Aggressive. So, for example, in the great disasters of these giant nuclear kettles, um, <laughs> there have been seven accidents. Uh, three of them weren't crazy significant. Four of them were more so significant, right? Mm-hmm. And um, in all of them, just like there was Chernobyl, Fukushima, and Three Mile Island, Three Mile Island, they were all human error. It's a scary thing to say, I told you so, but you should know that where there are people, there will be errors. You can no matter how many safety covers and procedures you do, there will always be errors. Mm-hmm. And I do think that one of the biggest fears is that it's inevitable that there will be more errors. And let's say you multiplied the number of power plants in the world by 10, and you made 100% of the world's energy production through nuclear power. Yeah. Okay. In that reference frame, we've had in 60 years, 70 years, seven accidents, four significant. If you times that by 10, you're going to at least expect one meltdown every decade, right? Just out of sheer human error. And the thing is, is that these nuclear power plants, when they melt down, it results in the death of thousands of people. Okay, like thousands of people. Um, And there is an argument to make that the presence of nuclear plants saves millions of lives because all these people, they're not going to breathe in as much CO2. There's not as much air pollution. Air pollution, yeah. Yeah, you know, and that saves millions. And there was even a study that came out and said that every year these power plants uh, save 9.7 million lives, which is huge, okay? That's fantastic. But when there is a meltdown like this, you have to take into consideration the weight of human suffering where you're saving all these lives there's thousands of lives in these meltdowns that it's not just death there's a significant amount of suffering alongside dying because of radioactivity you develop cancers your your cells can no longer reproduce and heal themselves like you see people with nuclear burns and what that generally means is that your skin cells can't heal themselves you want to take the risk that every decade you'd have thousands of people die in an atrocious way in terms of the chernobyl accident just that on paper is the worst accident in terms of a nuclear power plant melting down yeah about 200 people died directly from the meltdown uh one of the reactors exploded Sixteen thousand people will have or contract thyroid cancer yeah from it yeah and it is estimated that about one percent of those people will die yeah but still sixteen thousand yeah. people have to get chemotherapy i read something about this recently and i want to preface this by i'm not trying to be heartless but if you're going to get a cancer you want thyroid cancer mm-hmm. because you can remove the gland and then you just have to medicate yourself it's the most treatable it's very treatable to say it's a positive is kind of disgusting in its own it's right. It's a crazy thing to say, but... Uh, you know what I'm saying? Um, basically, the the point I just made is, oh, sure, look, it's a grand cancer. 
<laughs> yeah, it's totally daft. It's it's, it's yeah, it has no grounds. It has it no doesn't, grounds. But that's exactly the point I'm making about for me what the main con of nuclear energy is is that the potential for suffering is so big. Mm -hmm. It's acute numbers, but it's significant suffering. Right. You know what I'm saying? No it's, one's quantifying yeah, how, mu how much people are suffering from these yeah, things. Because, Whereas in yeah. terms of air pollution, yeah. their asthma may take them yeah. when they're 80 or 90 or maybe yeah. bronchitis or something to do with lungs, yeah. a lung infection mm -hmm. later in their life. Yeah. And they'll pretty much have no idea that yeah. the reason was because of the coal plant kilometres away. Absolutely. And that's true. It's because of the passive effect that air pollution might have on you. Mm -hmm. If you don't get a gust of air that picks up the leaves and the leaves form a person and the person punches you in the face, you're not going to blame the air. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's not a direct thing. It, you're just breathing. It doesn't hurt. Mm -hmm. it, you don't feel it. And you did it for 40, 50, 60, 70 years and then you died. Maybe a couple years younger than you should have. It's very hard to say, to point the finger at that because you, you forget about it. But if there's mm -hmm. a disaster like that and there's a significant amount of suffering, the fear of it is just the suffering that's associated, you know? Mm -hmm. It brings us on to the fact that that is what has fueled what is known as nuclear fear. Yeah, big Because time. there is something innate there that yeah. for some reason people aren't as scared of air pollution. Like, yeah. we aren't. We just aren't. I mean, yeah. you look at Hong Kong during a really smoggy day, or you look at, like, a major, major city in, yeah. in India, in China, in America, anywhere. Yeah. And the smog is so bad that you have to wear a mask. I know. But people are like, meh. <laughs> because meh. you can still function. I know. And it's, you don't have this yeah. invisible threat. You can physically see it. Yeah. You're like, ah, oh, it's a bunch of dust. I'll be grand. Yeah, but it's still passive. It's not hurting you. Mm -hmm. It's not, you, you're taking a breath and it's not like it's taking a shot of bad vodka. It, It's just air, dude. Yeah. You're just breathing in air. You don't notice mm -hmm. it. You've done it mm -hmm. all. You, why would you notice bad air? Why would you do it? Like, um, you've been breathing in all your life and, you know, you're not going to suddenly one day say, oh, well, this is subpar. You know, it's... <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, it's subpar oxygen. You know, I'm just going to hold my breath for the next 20 minutes. No, I'm just going to not breathe. You're going to have to deal with it, you know. Whereas you're totally terrified if you're if you're a couple of kilometers away yeah. from a, a place where a meltdown happened. Yeah, I, I think it's similar it, or, at le or at least it could be compared to the fear of flying, where flying is like one of the safest modes of transport in existence. And people are terrified of it. But cars are way more dangerous, way more likely to die. But people are fine with it. And I, I think it's, I think that there's the side of normalization. You're exposed to it all your life in cars. It's if you're in a cage with a tiger for a week, you eventually accept that the tiger doesn't think you look tasty. Yeah. And on the other side of that, I think it's a lot more terrifying to fear dying in a plane crash. I think that there's a despair and a fear there that's similar to the despair and fear associated with having a nuclear reactor around you that it drives you to be more cautious. You'd much mm -hmm. rather walk around in bad air because it's not a boogeyman that's going to scare you. Yeah. No, and I think that's all very f fair. Fear drives humanity, drives survival, and it's gotten us here, so it's very hard to ignore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That kind of brings us on to the other side of nuclear, which is War. all in all very, <laughs> very sinister. The understatement of the, of this, of the last century. <laughs> <laughs> and there, you know, me and Andrew oh. decided that we would try and take stances on this episode and on <laughs> nuclear science. I was looking at the positives of this sector <laughs> and how can we harness nuclear energy for the good of humanity there is literally nothing <laughs> beneficial about a nuclear weapon no let's make that abundantly clear yeah, to everyone no. there may be x y and z of amazing points to make yeah. about nuclear energy 
But nuclear weapons, Andrew, I have no idea on this one. <laughs> I'm stretching. But the only stretch I can think up of is that if a government is going to invest in nuclear and other governments have nuclear weapons, they're going to invest in nuclear so they can make a bomb for themselves and along the way they'll produce a reactor. It's very hard to be anti-nuclear energy and have a nuke. You know, like, <laughs> you know, there's no... The only, one of the only countries where that's the case is North Korea. Yeah. They've crazy. got their yeah. hands on nuclear weapons but they don't have nuclear energy yeah crazy it's the, literally maybe. the only country where that happens <laughs> maybe let's kind of bring it back to when they were making the first reactors and it was really exciting world war ii happens it's wartime and some of them jewish researchers come go, come to america and they tell mm. uh, theodore roosevelt you need to make sure that you get your hands on this technology before the Nazis do. Yeah. While they were making the Chicago Pile, which was the first nuclear reactor using uranium, they were also enriching uranium-235 yeah. to make atomic bombs. I'm saying that's crazy, but if I was in the middle of World War Two and I was scared out of my shirt of Nazis, I would also be saying, yeah, let's make a bomb before they do because they'll come and throw it at us if it's you or me i'm going to make it first yeah is it wrong yes don't make a nuke don't nukes are not good but if you're going to make a nuke i gotta make a nuke because otherwise <laughs> cause i'm going to make it quicker yeah exactly but you need to because if they nuke you and you can't respond there there is no response i do find it nuts that just three years after that chicago pile Mm -hmm. They tested the first bomb. And six months later, they dropped the first one. On Japan? Yeah. That's I, incredible speed. Putting it in that timeline, it, it shows how incredibly short-sighted it was. It was act now, act now, act now, act now. And you can understand that in a state of war. I suppose if you were an American general after Pearl Harbor, on your mind would be to get back at the Japanese... Yeah. But the pace of it, they tested it the same year they dropped it. And they Unbelievable. Were like, they were like, yeah, grand, that'll do. An explosion like never seen before. Mm -hmm. I think that it's just incredibly um, irresponsible, much of the way that humans treat nuclear energy and much of the ways that people treat nuclear power I think, and nukes themselves. I think that it's more power than we can comprehend it's like when you said 150 million degrees celsius Pfft, that's a that's a number to me i don't have a clue i i, I have no appreciation of what that is it's very mm -hmm. large it's definitely more than 20 you know it's you there's know no way that we can perceive that number in any way yeah. once it goes 100 degrees celsius <laughs> we're freaking out because water's yeah. boiling yeah exactly and we have so, no perception of that and i feel in the same way it is about nuclear weapons you can't appreciate the devastation that could be caused. Mm -hmm. But in saying that, you really should at least have a little bit of an idea that you should look after them. Um, <laughs> you should, you know, you should say, OK, these incredibly dangerous, incredibly bad things, you should look after them, right? You know, they, yeah. they should be kept very safe and you're saving them for the very, very, very darkest of rainy days. Yes. The, the darkest of rainy days where someone has said, I'm going to destroy everything you have. And then mm. you go, OK, well, as my last act. It's crazy how many nukes have gone missing in the <laughs> last 40, 50 years. Andrew, like, please don't tell me this, that they're missing. How there's many are the, missing? Like um, 50 to 100. Nukes that just... It's just crazy how many of these things happened, right? Just 1956 alone, they were testing these B-47 planes and all of that. And they lost like three of them. Just gone. Uh. Vanished. So the first one, this B-47, was carrying two nukes, right? It went over the Bermuda Triangle and it was never seen again with two nukes on board. Next. 
This isn't a missing nuke, but I think it's just, again, reckless. I think it's reckless, right? This yeah. was <laughs> this was also in 1956, and it was a B-47, which it was trying to land at a military base, and it couldn't land properly, and it skidded into a nuclear weapon holding facility, right? And crashed into six nukes, and all of them, right, were literally one switch away from exploding in the middle yeah. of America. Six nukes could have gone off just like that. So just to quickly go back to explain how close this was. Human error. Man, to explain how close this was, right, I'm, I'm trying to make a few points of just humans are the problem. In Inside of a nuclear weapon, right, we kind of mentioned it before, where you need a critical mass to reach that self-sufficient chain reaction, right? In a nuclear weapon, you have four, let's say, dumbbells, right? Four dumbbells of this stuff that mm -hmm. isn't of critical mass. Yeah. But the moment you want to ignite the bomb, you smash the four of them together to meet that critical mass violently. Yeah. Within all of the nukes, there was one dumbbell in each of them that didn't connect. So all of them had three of the masses pushed together, but it didn't oh meet God. critical mass to explode. That's how close it was. Crazy. Because that Holy could have... Holy crap. Yeah, that would have blown when up. When did that happen? 1956. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In 1958, right, there was a simulated mission, a practice mission, and a B-47 crashed into an F-86, right? Two planes, you know, hit into each other. The B-47 oh. holding a nuke, right? And... The, the plane had, so what the plane did was, the plane jettisoned the nuke out of it over the ocean, didn't detonate it, just, just was like, drop it there, better off there than where we're going, you know, right? And oh then, my god, they dropped it before they crashed. Yeah, they dropped it before they crashed, wow. but the nuke was never recovered. Oh my god. Okay. There's a bloody nuke at the bottom. Oh, is it I, in a lake? Is it in the sea? Where oh, is it? Oh, in the ocean, in the ocean, yeah. Any idea uh, where that I, is? Oh, I think it's in the. I I, feel, I think it was off the Gulf, so it was off of Florida. I think a lot of this was towards the Atlantic. <laughs> Florida, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What happens in Florida? It, it's it's so bad. Like so, yeah. Anyway, that was never recovered, right? So that nuclear bomb was never recovered. Now the next one is the is the sugar mama of the whole thing, right? <laughs> there were thirty four nukes and two nuclear reactors on this submarine. And they all vanished. In 1986, there was a Soviet sub on board. It had the 34 nukes and it had two nuclear reactors. Okay, you know, during that time, there was a lot of these submarines going around. And they were ready at any moment to let loose. You know, that was yeah, a part yeah, of mutually yeah. assured destruction. Yeah. But this submarine sunk. What happened was there was some water got into one of the missile holding bays. And it caused a small explosion. It wasn't. It didn't cause the nuclear thing to go off, but it, there was a control to zone, mm -hmm. and it b burst it. What oh happened God. was there was people on that side of the submarine who basically did everything they could, and a lot of people escaped. So the submarine was floated to the top. People got out. People were rescued. But mm -hmm. Then the submarine eventually it sunk. You know, it, it only had so much time. Eventually sunk. Okay, thirty-four nukes, two reactors. They investigated where this could have ended up. They found it on the, what's it called, the abyssal plain, thousands of meters deep. And all of the nukes were gone. They found that there were marks of tools. All of the bomb doors were swung open. And they were all gone. All this 34 sounds... nukes, all all reactive materials, everything. <laughs> this gone. sounds crazy. And this, yeah. <laughs> which, <laughs> for me, what, I, what I'm trying to get across here is that... My biggest problem with nuclear energy is not the energy, it's or nuclear weapons or anything like that. It's people. How could you let 34 nukes vanish? I'm trying to be as blunt as possible here. Losing one nuke in the whole world is a sin mm -hmm. that you should not really be forgiven for because you've given an unknown entity unlimited power, right? Yeah. To lose 34... I want to put that person in a rocket ship and send them to the sun because that person has made a cataclysmic boo-boo. 
Who do you think did that? Oh, don't or is that going into geopolitical oh. nightmare? It was a Soviet sub quite close to America. And when they found the sub at the bottom of the ocean, it had been like split in half by the pressure. The USA conducted the investigation and found that all the nukes were gone. So, there you, go. you know what I mean. It's anyway. uh, That's probably <laughs> where they went. Nothing, nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But like... Okay, every- so there's about, there's about 50 nuclear bombs missing. Yeah. That's because, terrifying. Because the terrifying thing about nuclear bombs is that once they drop to the bottom of the ocean, all you have to do is put the material in a dry cylinder and you're good to go again. The material won't lose any of its ability to become a bomb. Not for thousands or hundreds of thousands yeah. of years. So you just need to go to collect it and off you go. Yeah. For me, it all, like you said, it all comes back to nuclear fear. There's nothing wrong with nuclear energy. It's the cleanest. If you look at it from the perspective of the most number of people it would benefit, it is the best. Yeah. A big flaw in scientists is that we all look at things as like, we stand by the empirical evidence and we stand by it because it's true. Mm -hmm. And yes, it is true. It would save more people, but you cannot measure human suffering. And human suffering is a significant outcome of something potentially going wrong with nuclear energy. Mm Mm-hmm. And obviously, bloody bombs, Jesus Christ. It's kind of a positive thing to realise that through the end of the Cold War, after World War II, after the Cold War, Mm. several geopolitical treaties were signed to reduce the amount of nuclear weapons that they possessed. At the height of the Cold War, there were about 70,000 nuclear weapons around the world. Ridiculous. Yeah. Today, there is estimated to be around 16,000. Yeah. So a lot of them have been disassembled because there is literally no need to have them. Yeah. There's no need to keep them there. Yeah. And one amazing project is a thing called Megatons to Megawatts. You can take these nuclear weapons and all they are is enriched uranium or enriched plutonium. Yeah, yeah. Or for the case of the more powerful hydrogen bomb, it's just two different products. They're called mm. deuterium yeah, and tritium, yeah. which are just basically two hydrogens or three hydrogens together. Yeah. But not to get into too much detail about that, you can turn this enriched molecule back into and mix it with naturally occurring uranium or plutonium and put it back into reactors. Yeah. So that's what they did. And over 20 years, uh, it was 93 to 2013, they did that for 20,000 nuclear weapons. They they recycled them back into reactors. And so they used them as reactor fuel for energy. That's great. Which is amazing. So, you know, what the hell happened to the other, like, 40,000? I have no idea. <laughs> oh, I, I, I imagine they were just taken off the books. Um. <laughs> Which is simply something that I can't fathom. I know. But did you say there was 70,000? Mm-hmm. That number? You, you could probably, like, put the world into a nuclear winter with about... A hundred. A hundred. hundred. Mm-hmm. There has been research uh, into that, Andrew. Like, they they basically said to put the world in complete darkness by cloud cover, the amount of debris that is chucked into the air stays suspended for years. Yeah, of course. And that causes worldwide famine. Nothing will grow. Of course, yeah. And you're not getting sunlight, so you're not getting what Mm -hmm. we call photosynthesis, is where plants make energy. So you're... Basically screwed. <laughs> to put and it that's a hundred. Yes. That's a hundred. Yeah, which kind of makes... You're like, and now there's only 16,000. I'm like, oh, we... <laughs> Fantastic. And not to mention hydrogen oh. bombs. <laughs> what we've all talked about so oh. far is, again, using fission, which is breakup of uranium, breakup of plutonium. Yeah. But these hydrogen bombs, you can actually make fusion bombs. And so the biggest fusion bomb 
is called the Tsar Bomba, and the Russians made it. Ooh. How much more powerful was it in terms of um, tons of TNT compared to oh the little boy, which was the one that was dropped on Hiroshima? It, I imagine it was significantly bigger. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Maybe something along the lines of like maybe 10, 20? <laughs> 3,300 times. Like, what use are you going to have for that bomb unless we're about to get hit by an asteroid? Someone who's like, send the Tsar Bomba at it. That'll do it, you know? <laughs> the thing was, is the thing was so big that you can't drop that from a plane. You can't even no. put that in a nuclear submarine. You can't bring that somewhere. You can't send it. <laughs> you can't bring it you, here. What you can do is you can construct it and blow it up. Are you kidding me? The craziest thing is that in order to create a temperature to cause fusion, <laughs> you actually use an atomic bomb inside the fusion bomb. You That's have so you have you have two Abe. components. You have a fission bomb, <laughs> which is an atomic bomb, which is the one that they dropped on Japan. <laughs> then you have a fusion bomb, and they're beside each other inside a capsule right and the capsule is layered there's loads of stuff going on incredibly that complex nuts but yeah it creates such a temperature 150 million degrees <laughs> celsius causes hydrogen to fuse and that creates so much energy that that creates another chain reaction that just literally starts turning hydrogen in the air um, and, and, and using that as energy it's breaking my brain a little bit to think of how big a bomb must be to use an atom bomb as a fuse. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's like, literally what it is. That's literally what it is. Like, you know, you're lighting the, like, flammable thing on a stick of TNT and it goes in and it sets it off. That's literally how much bigger this fusion bomb is than the atom yeah. bomb. It's like, it was, let's light that. Oh, it's ridiculous. It was uh, 50 megatons of TNT power. So that's 50 million oh, tons Jesus. of TNT. I don't even know. Mm -hmm. Gosh, and so, I'm... so, so bombs smaller than this would cause craters the size of several kilometers, twenty kilometers, and constructed it in the desert in Kazakhstan, which is south of um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Russia, and oh blew it up God. there. Wow, that's crazy. I feel that nuclear energy has a place in yeah. society. It has a place to help. Yeah, I think so as well. Fight climate change, to reduce our carbon emissions. But that's it. In terms of a nuclear weapon, the only thing that you're going to create is death. Or blow up an asteroid or something like that. You know. Let's just send a bunch of nukes at the <laughs> asteroids that are going to hit Earth. Let's do it. Yeah, why not? Put on a little show in the night sky or something like that. <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm waiting for the, the next great leader to go, I'm going to bomb the Northern Lights. And, you know, <laughs> and it's going to be amazing. It's going to be amazing. And it'll just flip the switch from, like, green to purple. And they'll be like, it used to be green back in the day before so-and-so <laughs> nuked the Northern Lights. Well, on that delightful note... <laughs> Why don't you give us some more?